What's the good word, Josh? Your boy DKB here. So we have training camp coming up in just a little under two weeks. Um, and I know what's at the front of my mind is not only all the positional battles, but thinking towards the regular season, definitely what kind of cuts are going to be coming up. And uh, I think I have three guys that may be, uh, I don't want to say it's a guarantee, but I think it's as close to a done deal as possible unless there is just an exceptional performance week in week out uh capitalizing on every preseason game since we'll have four this season um and maybe you know some injury luck knock on wood i don't want to see any of our guys hit the ir report um uh, but with the three guys i'm going to mention this will uh, undoubtedly uh end up putting a, a a giant cross through joe douglas's 2020 nfl draft uh which was his first one on the books for the new york jets at that time under Adam Gase and uh, I don't think looking at how he's drafted the last couple drafts versus 2020 it does ow, it doesn't seem like he's uh, unable to recognize talent um, you can make the case that there were some easy home run uh, caliber players that you could have grabbed at the top but um, you know 31 other teams didn't get an offensive rookie of the year defensive rookie of the year they didn't have an entire draft class uh, that produced very well from top to bottom um so uh, you know i don't know it's an interesting case study with him i feel like he definitely fed into maybe whatever adam gates was trying to do that was also the first year of us transitioning um scout uh teams which means not only some of the personnel which from what i recall we kept a lot of those guys on um but also uh the way that they're scoring uh grading ranking these players uh was definitely a complete change so maybe that combination of factors led to a, a very disappointing draft class but basically all three of the guys i'm going to mention here shortly are going to be from that 2020 nfl draft class nine picks just for reference from that class and we may have one survivor in Makai Becton if things pan out very well keep in mind uh Jabari Zuniga <laughs> I don't from what I recall he didn't even make the team his first year in we cut him uh during training camp uh running back with Michael Perrine or P Ryan um he's bouncing around teams he's getting cut pretty frequently and I believe he's with the Chiefs right now um and I just seen a report that was saying that uh he's in danger of being on the chopping block again we had quarterback James Morgan, who was supposed to be maybe a long-term uh, backup option for us, which was a very strange choice, um, depending on the, not depending, but based on the way that our team was already built and the deficit in talent that we already had, uh, wasting a, an option, uh, I want to say it was a fourth-round pick, um, at, you know, that high in the draft class with some of the guys that were sitting around with strange tackle Cameron Clark he ended up having that career ending injury so we couldn't see if he would have been able to uh you know contribute long term for the Jets and then you had punter Braden Manning who we just cut uh in favor of a veteran that maybe has a couple more years left in the league uh if that so you know when you're looking at this class and maybe the best contributor here is your punter um it's a problem but let's go ahead and dive into some of these cuts so we're going to start off with Denzel Mims. Uh, there's a lot of reasons, right? A lot of people would have preferred to have just traded him last year uh, when it seemed like he had a little bit more value. Uh, positive reports were coming out. Um, he was able to see the field a little bit. Um, and then, of course, he was under the new coaching staff. So you felt better about uh, some of the opportunities and his utilization and none of that ever materialized. So... Most productive as a rookie is really his uh, calling card so far in the NFL, and it wasn't much to write home about. I mean, we're still talking about a guy that's fallen out of favor with two coaching staffs um, between uh, Mike LaFleur and then now this new one under Nathaniel Hackett. Career catch rate below 50%, which is atrocious, and he's never even caught a touchdown uh, uh, in the NFL so far, um, which you've seen plenty of guys flame out uh, and at least get that much done. So... It is concerning to kind of see that there's been a, a true lack of development here with a guy like him. Um, generally, you know, taking a look at his outlook on this roster, he has immense talent ahead of him, proven talent. And then the depth behind him also is high on potential. So he's caught in, in pretty much a void right now where he can't necessarily do. I can't see him showing enough 
based on what we've seen and heard so far uh, to impress this staff enough to continue to allow him to sit at the fifth uh, best case scenario uh, option on a roster, especially when he's not playing special teams. Uh, you know, for his career, he's only had three special team snaps. And this is after the team tried very heavily to get him involved in that last year um, during practices and stuff so that he can be uh, available in game days. And ultimately, uh, it sucks that we can't walk away uh, most likely without any kind of trade compensation back. You spend a second rounder on a guy and at this point we would still probably be happy to walk away with the sixth or seventh round draft pick. And we'll end up saving $1.35 million uh, when we cut him. It's not a great deal, but still having that uh, emergency pocket change, as I'll call it, for the season for inevitably when injuries hit uh, can definitely do us a lot of justice, especially when you consider some of the huge savings Joe Douglas has been able to find with guys like Quan Alexander and uh, most recently Connor McGovern. So second up, we have Ashton Davis, the longtime safety for the New York Jets. High special teams value. Um, you know, he... He's not necessarily in that Justin Hardy vein for the special teams unit as uh, the de facto leader of that position uh, or unit, I should say, anyways. Um, But he did contribute 75 percent of the special team snaps um, uh, for the 2022 season. So definitely a guy that, uh, you know, Brant Boyer was high on uh, in terms of going out there and trying to field a strong unit. Um, But generally, when he's been called up for the defense, he's allowed big plays multiple touchdowns often misdiagnosing plays you see him um not necessarily i don't want to say that he's not going to the action but you see him chasing down guys more so than uh being uh, ahead of the game uh so to say uh more often than not which is not what you want to see from your last line of defense in most cases uh, with kind of how he's been utilized so seven touchdowns uh he he's you know let up over his career He's averaged 18.6 yards per catch, which there is an anomaly. Last year, he only had, uh, at least according to PFF, two targets his way. So there was going to be a huge, uh, you know, uh, um, extenuation, extenuating circumstance there. Uh, but nonetheless, 18.6 yards per catch is crazy considering we would have tossed Marcus Joyner in the flames last year. And he almost let up. 20 when he generally hasn't allowed anything over i want to say it's 10.6 for his career so um tough work we are going to save 2.74 million if and when he actually gets cut um so again a uh, nice bit of pocket change there for us and to be honest i've talked about trading quite a bit i think that he can come in find a role that suits him very well right away uh and probably contribute out the gate um you know, better than what we've seen out of a guy like Ashton Davis, which was supposed to be a ball of athleticism that was a hard-nosed worker. And this is kind of a guy that I don't want to fault him too much because injuries have kind of derailed what could have been a promising career for him. Uh, But still, he's been under some pretty uh, strong coaching staff and Robert Sala from the defensive standpoint of things. uh, And we haven't seen much tangible improvement. So, It is what it is. Um, And then finally, we're talking about Bryce Hall. This was my guy when a lot of people were shredding him uh, prior to us going out and signing DJ Reedon and drafting Sauce Gardner. Uh, I definitely was standing up for him. So this uh, isn't necessarily from the standpoint that I don't think he can be a strong option in the cornerback room for us anymore. Uh, But it just kind of feels like the writing's on the wall. He's almost kind of like the Denzel Mims of the cornerback room where you see the talent that he's had especially after the season he produced in 2021 but there's just something that isn't quite uh meshing and fitting well and definitely seems like it's from a mental standpoint so uh we are talking about a 17 game starter again in 2021 16 pass deflections we just applauded Sauce Gardner for his 20 Obviously, the difference here is Sauce Garner's on another level in terms of coverage in all aspects of the game. Uh, But I still felt pretty strong about Bryce Hall, but he did allow almost a thousand yards. It was actually closer to 800 if we don't want to embellish. Um, But still, he was a guy that remembering the reports from back then, it basically said that the coaching staff wanted more of a playmaking presence in the cornerback room. And we didn't have that, even though Bryce Hall did was a strong option in terms of not allowing a guy to get the ball. Um, but 
replace for better playmaking ability, as I said, uh, and it proved to be the, the, the best move right away. Um, one interception in 30 games, so it's not like the guy has uh, much of a case for anything in that department. Um, and then he's also been kind of prone to giving up big plays, so he was a good contender for the ball. Um, but ultimately, the, you know, especially within the last year, um, I think preseason he got blew up. The regular season when he was tried just a handful of times, he got blew up. So disappointing. Ten touchdowns and just 163 targets. Um, so basically, uh, what is that? Basically every 11 plays or so, um, if he's targeted, he's going to let up a TD. So uh, not the best uh, that you want to see, especially um, at least in the at least in Adam Gase's defense, um, where there was a little bit more man coverage, but uh, it's, it's not as great either considering we're more of a, a, a zone coverage team to a certain degree uh, before we switch things up depending on, uh, you know, circumstances and then third down situations for us. Um, but still, I think he could be a solid insurance policy behind uh, guys like DJ Reed, Sauce Gardner, um, you know, Michael Carter the second. But we'll see what happens. If he does get cut, same boat as Ashton, we're going to save $2.74 million. Uh, so we'll see what happens there. And we do have some options behind him. Javelin Guidry, uh, Brandon Eccles definitely look like the better cornerback between the two. Um, you know, who knows if uh, Brandon Eccles was playing more of the CB1 role at the time. Uh, but let me know what your guys' thoughts are on these three cuts and uh, probably what you think about that 2020 draft class as a whole. And I'll catch you guys again. Peace.